started this journey together. From lighting our homes to lighting up our faces, we've kept each other safe and lifted each other to reach new heights. We've brought our loved ones closer together and made so much more possible. We are at the forefront of an unprecedented energy transition and our lives and livelihoods, economies and communities depend on change. What will our future look like? We want it to be sustainable. We want it to be equal and connected. A change like this doesn't happen by itself. We need to work together with more practical and fearless solutions than ever. From students to CEOs to lawmakers, each of us playing a part. Organizations and startups working together. We are the future of energy. Welcome to the Shell E4 Demo Day 2020, a celebration of the largest energy entrepreneurship conference in India. I am Siddharth Mehta, Deal Lead for the Shell E4 Startup Hub and Principal for Shell Ventures in India. And I will be your host for the day two of this three-day event. Yesterday, we heard some insightful discussions from prominent speakers and met startups working in the areas of innovative battery technology, shared mobility services such as fleet utilization and EV charging. Today's event is focused on the theme, digitalization of the energy industry. Each day, you can expect to hear from global leaders in the energy industry and also key players in the startup ecosystem. We are also excited to present to you the Shell E4 2020 cohort startup pitches on how they are disrupting the smart energy landscape through innovation and entrepreneurship. Please make yourself comfortable as we get started. And before that, I would like to advise you on one of the important safety measures for this virtual event, that is, have a right sitting posture. Also, kindly adjust the volume of your device and make sure you can still hear any safety alarms in the vicinity. Take note of your closest exit in case of any emergencies and do not attend this session while driving and walking. Now, let's get started. I would now introduce you to Tarun Verma, Vice President for Human Resources in Shell India, to give us an official welcome note. Over to you, Tarun. Good day and namaste. A warm welcome to all of you to Shell E4's Demo Day 2020. I'm Tarun Varma, VPHR for Shell in India. Energy transitions are nothing new, but the one underway is urgent. And we need to work together in this significant time of change, a time when the world is trying to address a growing demand for energy. And at the same time, it's moving towards a cleaner, lower carbon energy system. A time when everyone from countries to companies to individual consumers must play their part in reducing carbon emissions and improving air quality. Our aim is to deliver more and cleaner energy solutions to help meet India's growing needs. Leading this transition towards a lower carbon energy future Shell E4's objective is to help grow and stimulate the smart, clean energy startup ecosystem in India, creating value for both society and entrepreneurs. For this purpose, Shell E4 is motivated to bring together an ecosystem by linking talent, technology, capital, and know-how for energy entrepreneurs and other enablers to drive huge technological leaps and new ways of thinking about energy. The Shell E4 Startup Hub invests in the most promising startups to develop early insights in critical innovations and to build alignment and commitment with our partner companies and customers. 
Located at the Shell Technology Center, Bangalore, the Shell E4 Startup Hub provides world-class R&D facilities. On behalf of the Shell E4 program, I would like to thank our partners, ABB, AVL, WBCSD, Maharashtra State Innovation Society, Indian Angel Network, and Catapult. I'd also like to extend our thanks to our numerous mentors that have given so much time, support, and invaluable guidance. If you're a global energy technology startup, consider this rare opportunity. Shell E4 has recently announced applications are open for their international track, a program that supports startups looking to establish a presence in India where things are fast changing. Welcome again to Shell E4's Demo Day 2020. I'd like to now introduce Yuri Sebrex, Chief Technology Officer of Royal Dutch Shell, who joins us from Netherlands. Good day. My name is Yuri Sebrex, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Shell. Today's event is around the digitalization of the energy industry. Uh, Shell, like many other companies, is going through an era of rapid change. Of course, this year we have the global pandemic of COVID that's brought out a lot of change, but longer range and in the background, there are two mega trends in our industry that change everything around us. One is the energy transition, the urgent need to change the way the world's energy system works in order to not have air pollution in major cities and uh, global climate change whilst at the same time providing enough energy for the people's populations to, to thrive. The second mega trend is digitalization, which is affecting all our lives in many different ways. Now, digitalization and energy transition as such are two independent mega trends, but they do influence each other. And digitalization has an opportunity to help energy transition in many ways, in the way assets that already exist today become more efficient and lower carbon emitting, and also in coming up with the energy solutions of tomorrow. Now, within Shell, the pace of change on digitalization has been accelerating continuously the last couple of years. As recently as three or four years ago, artificial intelligence for application in our use cases, in how assets operate and how you find new sources of energy in the subsurface were in their infancy. And within the company, we had a couple of drones and a couple of robots deployed on an experimental basis. Fast forward to today, that is a completely different picture. This year only, we've got 48 artificial intelligence powered applications in deployment in the company. And we've enabled more than 5,000 frontline workers with mobile devices across 20 different assets to bring data and documents and workflows to their fingertips at the place of work. On robots, we've got more than 100 cleaning and inspection robots now active in the field. And we've flown more than 1,200 drone missions, uh, often with specialized sensors and equipment on the drones for aerial monitoring and emissions measurements and many other use cases. Um, since COVID, uh, the augmented reality application has increased by 600%. We've got more than 100 devices in 30 locations in operation. Now, digitalization is more than pure technology. It's also around culture and ways of working, how we get stuff done in the field. In order to do that, we are training many different people. And our computational center of excellence, where our deepest expertise sits, is based in India, in Bangalore, a growing activity. We also recently launched the AI residency program in Bangalore, a fully immersive two-year full-time program where people can work together with computational scientists and engineers in digital applications for deployment and maturation in the in the energy business. Um, the impact will be felt keenly over the next couple of years and I hope you will be inspired by everything that you see and hear today to join this journey and come up with new solutions for a future with more and cleaner energy. Enjoy. Thank you, Yuri, for sharing your insights on emerging trends 
and digitalization. Before we hear from the startups, allow me to introduce Daniel Jeevans, General Manager for Data Science at Shell. He will be facilitating a fireside chat with prominent thought leaders, Sridevi Bale, Managing Director of Energy Vertical at Accenture, and Dr. Adam Bumpers, Energy Digitalization Expert. While you learn from the eminent speakers, request you to bring forward your most pressing questions on digitalization and leave them in the box next to this. So hello and welcome to this section of the e Demo Day, which is a fireside chat all about the digitalization of the energy industry. My name is Dan Jevons. I'm the general manager for data science at Shell. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Sri Bale. Uh, Sri is with Accenture. She's been in the energy industry for 21 years and so is a true expert. She's currently heading the energy practice uh, where she's bringing cutting edge digital solutions uh, to life for her customers across the globe. She's also on the digital advisory board for the exploration and production sector set up in the government, by the government of India, and she's on the advisory board of Chemtech EPC. Uh, and I'm also joined by Dr. Adam Bumpus. Uh, Adam's a clean energy innovation expert, media presenter, and entrepreneur. He's the CEO and co-founder of Redbrid, Redgrid, who are bringing the internet of energy to a connected energy to connect the energy ecosystem. And he's also a senior research fellow at Melbourne University. So both of you, welcome. It's wonderful to have you with us. Um, obviously, we're in a huge period of change. We're all joining this fireside chat from our homes in, in Bangalore and in Melbourne and in London, respectively. Um, and so I wanted to start off with just a little bit of perspective on where do you really think the energy industry is in terms of our digital journey? And maybe I'll put that first to you, Adam. Yeah, thanks, Dan. It's great to be here. Um, like it's a really good question. Like, where are we? We talk a lot about digital energy, and we hear lots about this in the market. Um, and in some in some respects, you might look at it and think, ah, oh, we're you know we're, this is going really well. There's you know we've got a lot of more you know smart meter penetration. It's starting to happen. But if you think about, I mean, we always use the analogy thinking about the mobile phone in the late 1980s. This massive brick that Gordon Gecko used in Wall, you know in Wall Street. And if fast forward 30 years, and and you know, on Black for, on, on Black Saturday uh, in uh, in the U.S., they transacted 3.4 billion dollars in one day on mobile phones. So it's this like nuts evolution. And when we think about digital energy, we are nowhere near that. Absolutely nowhere near it. Like we're still a long way off where it can be. Um, we're at a very exciting time though, because I think, and I, I would love to hear Sri's perspective on this, because I think it's going to explode. But I, we're not, I don't think we're quite there. What do you think, Sri? So, so Sri, over to you. you. Yeah, I agree with you, Adam. Nice to be here. Uh, hi, Dan. Um, so yes, I think energy has made good progress uh, as an industry. But I guess there is lots to catch up, especially when you compare it with other industries like banking and health and CM, uh, uh, media and communication for that matter. Um, I would say the steps, the right steps have been taken. There is a lot of uh, uptake in terms of cloud and in terms of data management. And I think the right stage is being set, but there's lots more to be, uh, to be done in this space. So that's how I would like to kind of summarize in where we are in the terms of digitalization and energy. Super. No, thank you. I, I mean, and, and I would agree, right? I think we, we've made some amazing strides, but you can look at this glass half full or glass half empty. Uh, we've, we've come a long way in a short period of time, but I think there's still a long way to go. Mm. Um, but in terms of opportunities, I mean, we're obviously thinking carefully as Shell about where we're investing in this area at the moment, um, where it's going to have the maximum impact. Where do you see the big opportunities for the energy industry? So, Sri, maybe pointing that one back to you. Sure, Dan. Um, as I said, I think we have already taken uh, the first steps and have set a solid foundation now. There's a very high increase in uptake of cloud and the data management. Now, once we have kind of sorted out the data layer, I think just the cloud is, uh, the sky is the limit here, right? There's a lot of things which can be done. So I would say there's lots and lots of opportunities in terms of uh, bringing the analytics and the AI space, uh, AI solution in this space. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for us to go mobile. Um, I think now with COVID, a lot 
lot of things have changed and it has gotten a different perspective altogether now. So with cloud and data set in place, a lot of more opportunities emerging from there. Um, and of course, there are some other technologies like blockchain, which is increasing your trust in, in terms of data and how we manage uh, the data in this space. So yes, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, we have taken the right steps in the right direction and I look forward for more such innovations coming up in this space. Mm. Yeah, I mean, just to build on that, I think it's been amazing to see uh, you know, both the acceleration of cloud-based technologies and, and also, uh, you know, as you mentioned, mobile devices uh, in the field uh, for the energy industry and COVID has forced that. Um, you know, it's obviously a, a very challenging time, but there are certain things, I think, in the digital space where things have started to accelerate. Adam, do you, do you see the same things? Yeah, I do. I think it's a really good point. I think you touched on something there, Sri, that's super important, which is trust. Like how do how much do we trust what is happening in the in the transformation of the energy industry? What does digital energy mean when um, people are giving up more data from their houses about how they behave? There's a lot we can tell from people's uh, energy signatures what their behavior is in their house, and so there's a lot of trust that we have to have. Consumers have to have, and I think there is an amazing opportunity. And you mentioned blockchain and, and sort of post blockchain solutions. The building in um, inherent trust in, say, settlements and transactions, inherent trust that my data is secure and my data is private. Uh, you know, I often think about like the, the the WhatsApp of energy. You know, your 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 message is end to end uh, encrypted. Okay, cool. What does that mean for energy? I think there's huge opportunities there for um, for the when we when we move towards this digitalization uh, of of the energy of energy infrastructure and what that means for for an individual or, or a household or a business. Uh, trust is going to be absolutely essential, and and if we don't trust the energy companies that are that are working with with these kind of systems, then we're going to have a real problem in actually scaling this into the future because there will be there'll be dissent basically. And I think the last bit here is that what's really fascinating, I think, is um, the growth in sub-Saharan Africa. Like this is going to be a huge, huge opportunity in in digitalization of energy, much like we saw in in digitalization of uh, mobile telephones. And I think there's some huge leapfrogging opportunities there that the energy can and really must sort of take advantage of. I think and create you know new clean energy systems um, throughout sub-Saharan Africa. We're very excited about that. Oh, that's really fascinating, Adam. And and I guess I mean you picked up on two principles that maybe I want to uh, put to Shri. I mean. Op openness and trust in in this space because I think probably we all agree that um, as we move to cloud as as we start to standardize creating open data standards that are consistent are going to be core to accelerating the pace of innovation but at the same time with data openness we also have to maintain trust uh, because as you say there's a huge amount that we can tell from people's energy signatures Shri, I know you're you've been thinking a lot about that you mentioned that in some of the conversations that we had previous to this maybe talk a little bit about how you're thinking about baking those two principles into the way that you're approaching this at Accenture. Yeah, um, probably I would start with an example. Uh, let's take an example of open subsurface data universe, so something which Shell itself. Uh, great example. We love that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's a perfect example, right? Where you're maintaining the openness of data at the same time you're maintaining your differentiators, right? In, in terms of uh, data space. So you're differentiating the how part of the data and not the what part of the data, right? So just to put it in, in a nutshell. So this clearly say, shows, tells you how what kind of data needs to be inputted, what will be the different formats, what kind of enrichment you need to do, what kind of quality checks you need to do, what kind of APIs you, you will have to build on top of that layer to access that data. So once this is set in place, and of course, a whole lot of things around security, which is built on top of this, right? So once this is set in place, now it's a matter for you to actually extract the data from here and then building your own workflows and intelligence, which will actually create that kind of differentiation for you. So I think this, in a very nice nutshell, uh, uh, kind of, you know, um, as, um, summarizes how data is being looked upon. So data is a good differentiator for you when you put the data into the right use. But how you extract the data is, is something which is common across the board and that can be shared. So I, I think that's a good example to talk about. No, thank you. And, and for taking that initiative there. Yeah, well, look, thank you for supporting <laughs> it. And I think I think the way you put it, you know, I couldn't have put it better myself. And I think it's it's spot on. And I guess this is something that we're very passionate about is, is trying to accelerate an open ecosystem in top of common data foundations. And, you know, this is why we do things like E4. You know, we recognize we don't have all the answers. We need others to come 
and work with us, but we want to create common platforms to allow that innovation to happen at scale. Because if you don't have those common data foundations, it's very hard to scale up digital technologies. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe Adam, they're coming to you. I mean, you know, we've talked about we've you know we've made great progress. We've connected homes, sub-Saharan Africa, open data standards are emerging. All sounds like we're heading in the right direction, but. I think there are some really big issues to overcome. Maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the issues, some of the blockers that you see to the acceleration of this. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, on open data is super important here. And I think the challenge with um, with making this really work and scale, and we've done some, so regularly we've, we've implemented um, a project with one of the universities here, which is across their smart city campus. And they've got slow flow batteries, they've got you know, lithium ion batteries, they've got EV charging, they've got the whole gamut of a smart city basically. And the challenge to us was build us the, um, the zero proof knowledge network that enables us to understand what our transactions are doing at any one given period of time and know that it's true but don't worry about but having the data protected for those individual assets and so it's something that's really important we've got these open standards but what does that mean then for the individual and the customer holding on to that data and how do they play in that market what do they release and i think there's i think you know uh, zero knowledge proof is a really important part of that um i think you know as you said you know the the um the how and, and not necessarily what it is but it's super important but i think the biggest challenge is who is the customer of digital energy like who is really the the group of people who are going to benefit from this the yeah. most? Because there's a real challenge here, and especially as we move to a decentralized distributed energy network, is we have to match that distributed decentralized network with a distributed and decentralized architecture of data. Because I think that is the challenge. If we still rely, and, and to be honest, look, the cloud is important, but I think the cloud is a transition to serious edge-based computing. Now, we've yeah. had edge-based computing for a lot of different things. The cloud does it relatively well right now. But if you think about, you know, this 14% penetration of smart meters across the world, 14, one, four, across gas, electricity, and, and water, that is going to skyrocket. It's only going to grow about 7% in the next five years. But after that, it's probably going to skyrocket because the, the, the IoT devices are so cheap. Now, how do we contain that and use that through centralized systems. It's going to be incredibly difficult. So I think there's going to be a need for edge-based um, data management and processing, and that comes with it a whole host of needs for security and privacy and scalability of that data uh, through, through an architecture. So I think that loops all the way around to the customer. So we're talking about customers. Are we talking about people in houses, residential? Are we talking about small-scale, small, small medium-sized enterprises? We've seen through COVID, you know, like small and medium-sized enterprises really suffering from, from this economic shock. Um, but they will bounce back, and there may even be more because people have lost their jobs from large companies. So I think there's a real opportunity there um, to, to start to bake in these kind of decentralized systems of, of, mm. of data, and that's kind of what we do. But my, my, the challenge here is really understanding that customer because most people don't care about energy. They care about the function it has. And so... Yes when we're really getting down into the, the, the weeds on this about people, because it's not, it's like climate change. Climate change isn't a technological problem. We can solve it. It's a people problem. Like who is going to make these, who, who is willing to accept and who is wanting to push this forward? I think that's where our big blocker comes is education of, of what digital energy really is, how it can really help people's lives on a real day-to-day -day basis. And then what are those value propositions we can push up through industry, then connect that ecosystem we talked about that. So, so I think that's wonderfully provocative. Do they? Do people care about their energy? Um, I, I think I, it's a really interesting question. And Shri, maybe you want to comment on that. Do you think attitudes are changing? I think obviously historically it's been a commodity. I think we all will acknowledge that you know uh, it's been seen as a resource and and something that we just take for granted. It, is that changing? Do you see more engagement with the clients that you're working with? Yes, definitely it is changing. I can see a lot, um, uh, lot of queries and a lot of curiosity coming up saying that how do I contribute to achieving the net, uh, net uh, zero uh, initiative by 2025 or 2050? What were the goals they have uh, uh, taken into consideration, right? Uh, so it, it starts with simple things. So uh, let me just give an example. Now we're talking about a fuel station of future. Now, what do we mean by that? 
uh, this is going to be a place where it's going to be a culmination of different types of energies which is going to be provided, uh, be it for humans and be it for your vehicles. So when I say uh, vehicles, obviously you're going to see culmination of different types of energies, you know, your gasoline, your petrol, or diesel, your um, the hydrogen or the CNG, um, uh, electric, uh, electric uh, charging uh, uh, facilities. So all this kind of uh, technologies and this kind of fuels are, are, are going to be culminated under one roof. At the same time, the customer wants hyper-personalized and hyper-convenient services. So we are going to see again an amalgamation of you know, retail, be it, uh, no, uh, retail, health ports, utilities, all that stuff come under one hood. Now the question comes whether everything has to be merged always under one hood. The answer perhaps is no. So it depends on the kind of customers uh, you're trying to service in that particular area. Um, and then based on that, you will kind of get the mix and match of different um, energy solutions there, right? But but the customer is himself or herself going very conscious of this. Uh, so if you give a customer a choice saying that this particular fuel is actually going to give, give away so much so much uh, emissions of carbon compared to this, and are you ready to pay that extra $2 for that? I think by all means, uh, the customer will happily go ahead and pay that extra $2 simply because he's very conscious now. And uh, if the, once the data is shown in front of him, he's more... Uh, is more aware and he feels more confident that yes, I am contributing in that direction. And sooner yeah. or later, you will start seeing the other fuel demand go down and automatically this fuel uh, demand picking up and more focus is going to be here. So I definitely agree that customer plays a huge role in this and there is a lot of willingness and a lot of initiatives put up on the customer side as well uh, in, in this particular uh, direction. I think, Sri, that you just hit a really, really cool point there, actually, that it is this... Um, it's the kind of energy being, and, and you mentioned this, Dan, like energy has always been a commodity. We just, you know, you expect it to be there, but it's, it, it is shifting to be um, part of a part of a choice, like because you, because you have more choice, yeah. because there are, you, and I really like what you're saying there, Sri, that it's, it's you know, it, it's bundled in with, okay, how do I live, how does one live their life? Like, is it about, you know, it's about convenience, it's about costs, but it's also about principles. And I think that is increasing because the cost is coming down. That makes it a lot easier. But I really love that point and that that you've got the data in front of you, you know it's happened. And this does come back to, you know, settlements and transactions and being sure that something's actually happened and trusting what it is. And there's a load of great startups out there doing great work on, you know, digital PPAs and all that kind of work. But the, the understanding that what you've got in front of you is charging uh, and is coming from this source and is contributing, perhaps I'm, I'm getting rewards because my good behavior I'm doing right now. There's lots of good things that can wrap up into this. And I'm really excited to see that actually, that it changed from yeah. being a commodity into a, into a consumer lifestyle. And I think exactly. that is going to happen. And yeah, no. as a parent, I would definitely like to add, you know, you, you create a very good example in front of your kids and you actually walk yeah. the talk. Yeah. And that's a very proud moment. So uh, my kids come and ask me, you work for, you know, you're, you're mainly focusing on oil and gas sector. Is that really a bad sector? You know, things like that, what they hear in the social media. But when I talk about all these things, they really feel very proud of it. You know, no, they are in the right direction. At least yeah. they are something to be, uh, you know, say that, no, they are also taking, doing their bit and they are in that direction to help save the ecology and the ecosystem and, and, and the, the yeah. wider sense. I, I, it's great to hear that, Sri. And I think, look, you know, <laughs> as someone who also, you know, trying to work on how we transform oil and gas using digital technology, as well as some of these new energy ecosystems, I, I totally echo that. And I think it's, um, I actually think it's exciting. I see a lot of groundswell within the in industry that this is now becoming a movement and something that we have to do um and i think there's you know focusing on the customer is going to be the key to unlocking it as you say and and maybe just building on that i mean you know i mentioned one of the things that we're focused on in shell is trying to make sure that we help not just develop these sorts of transformations within the company but also use the ecosystem outside and um you know we're here talking uh, at the e4 demo day uh, and and i think the key point there is you know we want we need these new and innovative startups to help catalyze some of these changes. So maybe coming to that, and, and Adam, uh, as a startup founder yourself, where do you think the biggest opportunities are uh, for startups in the digitalization of energy? Um, yeah, it's, well, firstly, it's really hard, right? Because we're dealing with these <laughs> massive systems that we've had for, well, since the late 1700s, right? We're dealing with things we're going to try and change that are 150, 160 years old. So um, I think... 
we all, I think then the biggest opportunity that we have uh, in startups is, is looking at this from a holistic perspective, from, from an ecosystem perspective. I mean, an energy ecosystem perspective, because one of the things that we see is that there are really amazing um, technologies that are already being rolled out. There's really, you know, incred incredible, obviously, you know, project finance covers renewable energy generation now. It's it's pretty standard. It's very de-risk. It's very easy to use. It's very easy to plug in. I think that's helping drive some digital integration. But I think the bigger part is where are those connections through the digital ecosystem? You know, how do we do this? And so, I mean, I guess from our perspective, you know, we bought a box that basically integrates APIs and enables things to take control through that API crunching machine. And, and we see that as absolutely the future. It's the ecosystem connections that come through that, that then provide something valuable to the end customer. So we don't have to create, essentially, we don't really have to create these massive new verticals. I think we can create an interconnected node system of, of like a real ecosystem. And I think that's where the opportunity lies for startups is um, to dive into the ability to use um, interconnectivity between the existing systems to create new uh, approaches. Now, I'll give you an example. This is also about um, walled gardens. So like there's a lot of walled gardens out there. Hey, here's our brand, just use this brand. That's totally fair enough, but it won't get us to where we need to be in terms of our energy transition. So we see the ability as, hey, there's a walled garden, awesome. Do what you do over there, but you need to talk to the other walled gardens. Absolutely. And if you get all those wall gardens with a door in between each of them, we've got a whole bunch of beautiful gardens that understand each other. Um, we just need to provide the, the the gateways to that. And we see that as digital energy, and that's APIs, the ability for APIs to really understand each other and provide something valuable to the, to the, to the end user. Um, and so we think it's two things. It's an infrastructure, as in the fundamental underpinnings of how this data is transformed, and a community. As you said, Sri, there's a there's buy into this now. Um, a lot of our corporate clients are like, yeah, we want to hit net zero by 2030. That's this publicly stated goal, and and that's it. They're in. So it's really interesting to see this happen. Um, I think the other part is the last bit is, um, you know, this ecosystem uh, industry in insurance and in energy and in automobiles and all the all the different sectors around the world is worth about 11 trillion dollars in about five wow. years. So it's a big industry. We've just got to apply it well to to energy. Super. And, and um, is, my team will be proud of me. I've gone a, a very long time without talking about AI, which is not normal for me. So I'm going <laughs> to do it now. Um, so I'm sure we, were, we were exchanging notes before this on uh, on AI as a key opportunity. And that's something I firmly believe that, you know, Adam, as the wall gardens open up, as open data standards start to emerge, I think AI is going to play a key role in energy mm. going forward. So, and I know you share that perspective, Sri. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about, you know, how you see AI playing in the startup ecosystem. Oh, I see AI playing a very big role. Um, so technically what's happening now is uh, we have all the, the old systems, if I may say, uh, the legacy system, which is already existing, and nobody has got the money or the kind of uh, uh, time to actually go ahead and change things. The only way to build, build or rather to make the systems more intelligent is you add that layer of analytics and AI on top of it, right? And that's where you hit the nail on, on top of the, you know, on, you hit the head on top of the, uh, uh, the problem. Uh, so, uh, so AI is actually going to help you open up a lot more opportunities, be in terms of your trapped values, and especially when you actually when you integrate across systems. And when I say systems, like uh, take for example uh, upstream, so it can be within exploration and production. So while drilling a well, what is the the subsurface uh, lithography which has come up? How can I uh, on a real time basis change the drilling of the well? Similarly, uh, within downstream, based on the market dynamics, how can I change the product mix? I know it's not so easy to actually configure your entire refinery setup based on the product mix you want to develop, but still based on the AI and the insights being generated, how can you configure that to get the maximum uh, output and to increase your uh, GRM per se? At the same time, reduce your carbon emissions and have a better HSSC and uh, process safety. Uh, similarly, when it co goes to retail or to the end consumer, now how can you provide those kind of pointed offers, uh, hyper-personalized and convenient services, what we can offer? So there's a whole lot of things which can be done. And, and we can also kind of combine all those things and, and, and also see how a change in an upstream value chain can actually impact the end customer. Mm -hmm. So I think Absolutely. that's huge. And this kind of magic can be achieved only when you add that layer of uh, AI on top of the existing data sets uh, and the systems what we have got. So that's what I firmly right. believe in. And I do as well. I mean, I think you know, we see, <laughs> Michelle, just the range of potential applicability for AI 
and also how transferable it is between different yes. parts of the energy industry. It, and I think that's, you know, you talked about the, the value chain, being able to move solutions in between different parts, the same solution to and apply it to different parts of the value chain. That's what gets me really excited about the potential that AI has. So, I think that's, but you're also right, AI, AI is so important because it's about complexity and taking complexity and making it useful. And I think that's the, it's such a, we're going to enter a world of increasing complexity in energy. I mean, it's already happened, but it's going to get more more problematic. Cool. And so I think, yeah, absolutely the layer of AI is, is so important. But I think we've got to challenge ourselves a bit around like, what is, who is the AI for? Um, who is, you know, what, what are the outcomes we're going to get from this? Um, and I think there's, you know, there's something there for us to really understand around, okay, we've got all these data streams coming in. Um, how do we optimize AI for the, I'll go back to the customer. How do we optimize AI for the actual customer? Absolutely. Uh, I think there's some really cool stuff that we can work on there. Big, big challenges. Yeah, I think the personal definition really matters a lot there. I completely mm. agree, yeah. That's cool though. So I think we're, we're heading to a close, guys. It's been a fascinating conversation. I've really enjoyed having both of you with me. Um, I guess, you know, one final thing I wanted to ask you. Um, we're at this demo day. We've got a whole raft of startups pitching. There's some really exciting stuff coming out. Um, you guys have both been in the industry for quite some time. If you had to leave with one piece of advice, what piece of advice would you give to a startup in the energy industry today? Adam, coming to you first. Um, that's a great question. Um, Start coming to the energy industry today, I would say, um, well, I would say there's two things. Uh, be humble and be inquisitive. So it's like, find, really try and understand what the problems are that you're trying to, try, trying to address um, and be humble that no one has the full solution. Like it just doesn't exist. It's too complicated, but there could be some really amazing um, sort of gold nuggets in there. So my, my advice would be be humble, be inquisitive and keep going. It's the it's the it's a hard industry to be a startup in, right? We're not we're not in Silicon Valley, um, doing especially if you're a startup. We're in Melbourne, like we're in the middle of Australia. There's amazing opportunities here, but it's not like you're creating a new Facebook, right? What we what we're doing here is trying to fundamentally change the way the world works. That's an amazing task and quest to have. So just keep going. Great advice, and and Sri. Okay, I would say uh, first of all, be very curious. Um, at the same time, don't go and ask the customer or your clientele, what is the solution you are looking for? You know, uh, I, I always keep quoting this uh, fourth uh, did mention if I'd gone to the customers and asked, they would have told me a faster horses and not a car, right? So think out of the box. Uh, you really need to come out with very innovative solutions. And given the place where startups are positioned, I think there's a lot more agility and nimbleness which, using which they can actually experiment a lot. So I would say be, uh, be curious, but don't give in to the solutions what the customer is asking you, but you come out with your out of box uh, uh, solution. Uh, and the second thing is what I would like to say is, you know, whenever you're designing your solution, keep in mind the core human um, at the center. Don't expect him to change his behavior. Uh, you know, suddenly a human cannot behave like a robot, right? So don't, your the, the, your solution should come very naturally for the human being to go ahead and use it. And it should not be a big mega change management exercise which needs to be done. I think if you crack this two pieces, you're on a roll. Yeah, great. Brilliant advice. <laughs> Look, with that, I'm just going to say a huge thank you to both of you. It's been a fascinating conversation. I think given us a variety of perspectives on where energy is going and, and hopefully as interesting for the audience as it was for me. So thank you for joining me and we'll speak again soon. Thanks, Dan. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. What an insightful discussion. Allow me to introduce you with great pleasure some of the Shell E4 2020 cohort startups who are also pitching on the other two days. My name is Davik. I'm the CEO and founder of GoGreen EOT. GoGreen EOT is a deep tech electric vehicle startup uh, which started off in 2016. And I, as a founder, have about 13 years' experience in the electric vehicle space itself. At GoGreen EOT, we have an L1 approved vehicle for ride on Indian roads, which is longer in terms of range, which is safer from a battery perspective. And the battery that we have has 2x the life as against any of our competitors. And besides this, we, our vehicles also come with advanced technological features. And at a company level, we've applied for close to about 16 patents with about six grants. 
Tripoli Taxi. We made the world sustainable by transforming the way you travel. It's an end-to-end e-mobility solution provider which integrates the EVs, charging infra, and state-of-art technology together to save companies time, money, and carbon emissions. Additionally, we create a shared EV charging network for other EV users to charge their vehicles. Offgrid is a clean tech company building novel, cost-efficient, and sustainable batteries for stationary and mobility applications. Our first product, Zingel battery, is packed with breakthrough innovations that enable a performance of lithium-ion at one-third the cost, driving disruptive ecological and commercial impact in the various applications. Off-grid has partnered with global companies in energy ecosystem to build, validate and deploy its Zingel batteries. Is the fear of how to charge and where to charge keeping you away from adopting clean electric mobility? If that is a problem, we at Magenta, under a brand ChargeGrid, are trying to solve the challenges of EV charging in India with India-specific solutions, be it the hardware, software, or business models. With over 64 chargers installed and an experience of installing more than 150 chargers across 16 states in India, we are helping empower electric mobility in India. Commutec is one-stop solution for corporate passenger mobility. Corporates can utilize compliant vehicles from Commutex network of digital fleet operators. Compliance, security, visibility, data integrity, and fleet availability have always been five major problems in this $5 billion industry. Stay tuned to learn how Commutex control tower approach resolves these issues while still staying operationally profitable. Since 2007, AP Kimi offers commercially proven technology and plans to chemically recycle toughest and dirtiest plastic waste into sustainable fuels, chemicals and feedstock for producing circular economy plastics. Having commissioned over 30 plans till date makes us global leaders in paralysis. We have published four patents in paralysis and we are supported by acceleration programs of Royal Dutch Shell and Alliance to End Plastic Waste. Enebus is developing an AI IoT platform for large multi-site food chain and gas station customers. We help them to reduce their energy costs and carbon emissions and curtail demand surge from EV battery loads. We have executed contracts worth over $5 million in sales revenues in the last four years, and we are now seeking more partners and Series A investors to accelerate our growth. Thank you. With the changing climate conditions and digitalization is new normal, iAutomation started with this idea in 2017. iAutomation offers comprehensive intelligent building IoT platform for healthy and sustainable built environment. Nirvana makes solar and wind power dispatchable at the lowest levelized cost of energy. Nirvana's patented thermoacoustic power generator operates for 20 years, maintenance-free on any fuel, reduces global warming gases, and efficiently cools coronavirus vaccines to minus 80 degrees C. Hope you had a good glimpse of our promising startups. Now you're about to meet the startups disrupting the digitalization of the energy landscape. Allow me to share some guidelines on how you can actively participate. Firstly, you can invest. You have all been given a nominal $50,000 worth of virtual currency to invest in these startups. Please refer to the video player below for more instructions. Secondly, you can engage. During the pitches, feel free to ask questions in the box next to the video player on your screen. Thirdly, meet the startups. At the end of the presentation today, move into the live virtual booths and actively participate with the startups to ask and hear on their disruptive innovation and scale-up journeys. You can find their unique profiles on the platform to access their virtual booths. Finally, connect with the startups. If you are an investor or connect on potential commercial opportunities, click the Connect Startup button on their dedicated profile now, the eminent industry experts, who are also the customers and partners of our startups, will be introducing them. Please welcome CEO of Logos India, Mehul Shah.
Hello everyone attending Shell E4 Demo Day. I am Mehul Shah, CEO of Logos India. At Logos, we develop very high quality industrial and warehousing infrastructure across Asia Pacific. Uh, we are very passionate about environment and sustainability uh, in our value delivery to our customers. With Logic Ladder, we are setting up and working with them to set up our sustainability framework platform such that we reach a leadership position by 2024 across Asia Pacific. Their, their model is, is highly scalable and very strong, enabling the decision making, data driven decision making to manage sustainability. We've also integrated the carbon management such that we have a net zero emissions by 2024. It gives me immense pleasure in introducing Mayank Chauhan, uh, CEO and co-founder of Logic Ladder to you. Thank you all. From Gurugram, India, Logic Ladder. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Mehul. We are proud to work with Logos. But let me share the wider picture of the challenges Mehul and many CXOs face today. There is an urgent and complex challenge of climate change and stricter regulations that CXOs need to address. Net zero means rapidly reducing the amount of carbon, water and waste to neutralize the climate impact of the business. Sustainability needs to be managed every day. To reach the net zero goal means that Mehul needs to have an accurate amount of emissions, water, use and waste generated for logos. Accounting that can help him understand every debit and credit. The sustainability data is currently locked in various systems like SCADA, BMS, IoT, energy management systems, spreadsheets and emails. As Logos engages and serves companies seeking their own net zero, it means they have to put their house in order too. Secondly, stricter regulatory framework globally means that environmental compliances have to be managed with more importance. Non-compliance and more so no data to prove compliance can lead to large fines and works bankruptcies or shutdowns. Today, a platform to manage corporate sustainability is missing in most enterprises. This leads to inaccurate and delayed carbon accounting, higher compliance risk and increased costs. Logos is not alone. More than 200 companies from the Fortune 1000 have already committed to net zero and this number is increasing every week. With the sustainability cloud platform, we have unleashed a multi-billion dollar opportunity to manage the net zero journey for our customers. You may be facing these problems too. Logic Ladder has created a platform that allows you to capture your environmental impact in terms of energy, emissions, water and solid waste data from one single epicenter. It autonomously acquires sustainability data from multiple sources in a single enterprise-wide repository. Now this solves a major issue of siloed data with increased accountability and accurate carbon accounting. And it manages all energy types including utility, fossils and renewables. So it keeps a tab on your effluents, emission, air quality, waste and water consumption. It provides data visualization, configurable dashboards and reporting. The evolved alert and escalation engine to identify outliers and non-compliance immediately puts you in a more productive position to manage your net zero journey. Now, we also leverage the collected data to help you get the best out of it. So not everybody in a company understands compliance. We enable you by including all state and federal regulations into our platform to ensure headache-free compliance. This ensures that you manage risk and always take a high pride in having zero deviations. A machine learning and AI techniques enable anomaly detection and prediction. We are continuously working on algorithms to convert data to suggested actions and these suggested actions to concrete actionable tasks. We ensure that all stakeholders are actively engaged in enterprise-wide contribution to meet the sustainability goals. So sustainability reporting has started to assume regulatory proportions. We position you to have compliance reporting and management in accordance with not only your local norms but the global standards like the GRI, CDP and GRITSB among others. With other solutions, you have to open different forms, gather data, correlate this with your business requirement. With us, this is real-time, unified and everything happens from one platform. Our integrated approach uniquely positions your organization to manage your net zero ambitions with ease. We make it simple for you to engage with us. You can sign up with us on a pay-as-you-go model 
Start small with one of your facilities and then expand to the hundreds or the thousands that you may have. Our solution fits like the manufacturing plants and the buildings alike. It works for ease for simple retail outlets or even complex integrated infrastructure. We have already raised 1.5 million USD and added 600 paying customers. And if you are an interested investor, we love to talk more. Thank you for your time. And if you are facing challenges in your net zero journey, please reach out to us and talk to us about how we can manage your carbon and create your sustainability balance sheet. So can your platform collect data from sensors and existing systems? Great, yes. So our platform is designed in a data source agnostic approach. So we can collect data directly from the sensors through our IoT layer or from any third party systems alike. Now uh, the platform is designed to automatically interface with systems like the SCADA systems, the BMS or third party softwares so that you don't have to bother about the collection of data related to your sustainability needs. Now, uh, one more thing, we are like sensor agnostic, we are uh, communication protocol agnostic, we are cloud infrastructure agnostic. Now, what does this mean? This means that you can, we can easily engage with you to have a central sustainability data lake. So that, that makes it very easy. So next question, uh, which standards of compliance and reporting do you support? Mm. Now, yes, so that's a, that's, uh, I'll, I'll try to answer that in a brief fashion. Uh, we provide compliance in conjunction with the environmental norms uh, currently present in India, in Europe, in Southeast Asia. So all governments are taking steps to comply with the Paris Agreement and we are kind of a step ahead in that journey by already implementing uh, this nationwide uh, for the Indian government. Now for the sustainability reporting, we support the G uh, GRI framework, the CDP, the GRSB and the SECR. And we continue to add uh, the, D the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, the UNDP and uh, SDG among others. Now, also, if there are any internal compliances that your organization has, the platform is capable to model them as well. Okay, next question. So, how do you charge your customers? Okay, again, uh, our, our business model is enterprise software as a service. Uh, so, we engage with the customers on a per facility, per year basis. Now our engagement model is very flexible and it fits all sizes of facilities and industry types. So we have a like a network of partners that can take care of the system integration needs for the facility and you get a turnkey and a seamless experience to begin your net zero journey. Please welcome seismic processing geophysicist Dave Reynolds. Reslytics is making exciting new tools for well planning by applying AI, ML, and DL methods to increase reservoir yield by about 25% using intelligently planned well paths through an improved seismic resolution and well tie inversion volumes. I'm Dave Reynolds, a seismic data analyst with 35 years of upstream experience with BP and Fairfield Industries. I met Dip Nanda in 2010 at the University of Houston. I've been following Reslytics since June of 2020 and I'm excited about their progress. DIP is a true innovator and entrepreneur who applies geophysical knowledge and seeks the counsel of advisors while leveraging new methods and tools to advance Reslytics. From automated data QC to new seismic algorithms for enhancement, spectral decomposition, and ML-assisted inversion, each tool is impressive when compared to standard industry methods. It is his vision to have Ira, the intelligent reservoir assistant, as a voice activated interface to all of these tools. From Gurugram, India, Reslytics. Hello, everyone. We are Reslytics, and we are bringing in disruptive AI tools to the oil and gas industry. The upstream oil and gas industry today is under tremendous pressure to optimize costs while improving productivity. Firms currently use industry standard softwares, which involve time intensive manual workflows, leading to inefficiencies in data interpretation. The results from these workflows still have limited resolution, leading to inaccurate forecasts, suboptimal drill paths, and hence low performing wells. What is needed is a solution which can provide super resolution from our existing datasets. 
This is exactly where we come in. Our automated workflows and self-learning algorithms provide the necessary enhancement in resolution and allows data interpretation to happen in weeks time, which otherwise would have taken months to complete. It further enables maximizing productivity with accurate forecast. Let us look at a comparison. On the left is the input data, in the middle is the industry standard. We can see that the improvement in resolution is still limited. In the right is what we achieve through our proprietary technology. We see that there is multifold increase in resolution and accuracy. After achieving super resolution, we can more accurately forecast the recoverables. Let me show you the enhancement in productivity achieved as an example. After incorporating various datasets and performing super resolution, our predicted recoverable barrels of oil model shows zones of enhanced productivity with recovery increasing from 42,000 barrels to 60,000 barrels in this case. We also find an additional drilling path, which was otherwise unseen, leading to an additional 45,000 barrels a year. This translates to a revenue increase of 2.5 million US dollars, which is quite substantial. Our business model is quite simple. We offer these solutions in the form of software as a service to firms and have successfully completed three pilot projects for major global oil companies. We are in the process of finalizing a contract with a large oil and gas firm as we speak. Our vision for the future is for companies to have conversations with our AI engine IRA, which incorporates all our proprietary machine learning models. This AI engine will also be flexible to perform users' tasks on a daily basis. We are a three-year-old startup and have a core team of six members. I am Dip Nanda, the founder and CEO of Resolytics with an industry experience of 10 years. Dr. Bharat Shekhar leads our research and development with a research and academic experience of 10 years. Mr. Narendra Verma, the former managing director of ONGC Videsh, has a rich industry experience of more than 37 years and leads our business development efforts globally. You can reach us or contact us to know more about our offerings and also sign up for our pilot. Thank you. We have received a few questions, and here's the first one. What are the growth prospects of Resolytics in an industry which is moving towards renewable energy? As the oil and gas industry is accelerating digital transformation, the demand for automation is growing at an exponential pace. This is where we see our growth. Now, the move towards renewable energy is also encouraging us to innovate new products and implement our present technology in the space of carbon sequestration. Here's the second question. What is the unique selling point of the services offered by Resolytics and its applicability towards diverse subsurface settings? Now, our USP is that we achieve three to four times enhancement in resolution compared to our competitors. And our unique architecture has been tested in various variety of geological settings and has delivered robust results. Please welcome Program Manager of Shell E4, Sanjay Bakshi. Hi, I'm Sanjay Bakshi, Shell E4 Program Manager. And today I'm pleased to introduce you our digital startup, Stella Technologies. Stellar Technologies helps large enterprises on how they can leverage their data assets stored in the PDF documents. Let's hear more from Aruna. From Bengaluru, India, Stella Technologies. Aruna Schwartz, CEO and founder of Stellar Technologies. We are focused on the problem of extracting information from within documents and converting this 
into structured digital data. The documents could be numerous technical and engineering documents, starting with process specifications, could be maintenance manuals, illustrated parts catalogs, and repair bulletins, to uh, give a few examples. This is a manual, or at best, semi-automated workflows within companies, causing significant loss of time and productivity. Some of the examples of these manual workflows are highlighted in the next slide. Our software automates this process and creates structured and reusable information, which can be injected into various enterprise applications like uh, supply chain, maintenance and repair uh, organization and planning, interactive publishing, and predictive maintenance. Our software is deployed across multiple uh, uh, industrial sectors, from aerospace and defense to rail, OEMs, etc. The reason we can move across sectors is because of the core technology, which is an expert system with over 80 plus pattern recognition algorithms. And this enables us to train the software with a maximum of 10 documents. Unlike AI solutions, which require a huge data set to train documents, and we can be deployed within an enterprise in under two weeks. Some of the examples of our customers and partners are in the next slide. And finally, us, our team members are on the last slide. Thank you. How can you use your aerospace experience and bring it across to the oil and gas sectors? Documents in the aerospace, so taking the example of an avionics uh, or an engine manufacturer, there are various kinds of documents starting at the production phase where there are process specifications, material specifications, etc., which go into the design phase. There are various other documents like bills of materials, um, contracts between vendors, and enveloping the whole thing, the entire regulation framework, which could be documents from the National Aerospace Authority, etc. All of this is a paper-based paper -based workflow, at best stored in PDFs, and documents are recreated each time. When you get to the aftermarket processes, the, docu the information within the, you know, the documents that I cited before have also got to be fed into maintenance manuals, illustrated parts catalogs, um, engine manuals, repair bulletins, etc. There's a huge loss of time in recreating documents at every step of the engineering process in the aerospace industry and transforming all of this into a structured digital standard is something that has been in progress for a while, for the last five to 10 years. And um, this is the you know, kind of uh, change that we can bring to the oil and gas sector because the document types at all the stages of the process are pretty much similar. Question two. How can your technology, you mentioned your technology could adapt to various um, types of documents across sectors. Can you explain a little bit more? Since the te core technology is based on pattern rec recognition algorithms, and we do not really need to understand the semantics of what's written within the documents, unlike all AI solutions, which need a huge data set to map meanings of what's written in them. We can, and since most engineering and technical documents look the same, have a similar sort of content, have same patterns, we are able to deploy it, as I said, with 10 documents and across vertical sectors. Three, can you talk about specific use cases in um, oil and gas that you can think of, that you have experience of? Um, one of the sectors that I think could be that um, I think could be 
very um, could benefit with our technology is in the refinery sector where there are huge plants with multiple you know if you can compare a refinery to an aircraft there are multiple vendors multiple pieces and multiple processes running through them streamlining all the documents which i'm you know on i'm positive like the aerospace industry is similar is mainly PDFs. Streamlining all this, getting this into a structured output would also be a huge time saving and significant increase in productivity for the oil and gas sector. Please welcome Business Development Manager at Rajhans Group, Arjun Patel. Hello everyone, uh, this is Arjun here from Rajans Group. Before a year back, we were facing a problem of workplace productivity and we really wanted to know the root cause of the problem. Uh, I thought it may be air pollution. By working with Vignesh from Gel Technologies, we have found out that our office location was situated in polluted area, which used to affect our employees' productivity in terms of mood swings, laziness, etc. We really come to know that the environment indoor and outdoor is much important parameter to consider. We are also monitoring our indoor office environment as well and gives us actionable alerts which helps us to take some corrective measures towards the productivity. After six months, we have seen some great results as well. I must say thank you to Mr. Vignesh and the entire Prakruti team. We are really enjoying working with you. Thank you Mr. Vignesh. Over to you. From Surat, India, Jal Technologies. Hello everyone. Myself Vignesh, the co-founder and CEO of Jal Technologies. It is an IoT company and we are into environmental impact startup based out in Surat. Using our technology, we are monitoring environmental health of more than 15 million people. In COVID-19 era, we are more conscious for our health and we know pollution kills a huge number of people. Adopting the right practice, we can save 10 million human life every year. We unconsciously breathe 20,000 liter of air every day and we do have a better control over water and food, but not on the air. Let's more talk about the key identified challenges. First, I'll say there is a huge lack of information about air pollution among the people. Public participation plays a key role in air quality inventions. There is a need of scalable hardware to install across the country to evaluate real-time data of pollutions and that's how we are reaching closer to identify the real problem. The global environmental monitoring market was about 16 billion in 2018 and projected to reach a 29 billion by 2026. Government has installed less than 100 monitoring stations across the country and they can't install more because the present environmental monitoring systems are expensive, human intensive and it's required a high electricity and ground space. As for me, this is not a sustainable and scalable solution at all. We can see almost entire map, our red or a partial red, our potential market force. In 2019, government has launched a national clean air program, a time-bound national level strategy to reduce a PM 2.5 pollution by 20 to 30 percentage in 122 cities in next five years. This is an immediate opportunity for us and total immediate serviceable available market will be 100 million INR. So we have come up with a smart, cost-effective and highly scalable solution, Prakriti. It's a sensor-based device having a deep learning algorithm and low power solutions. Our hardware is capable to monitoring all environmental parameters like dust particle, toxic gases, radiation, noise and many more. If we compare sensor-based device versus conventional technology, then our solution is 95% more cost-effective and no additional power and ground space required. It can be installed on any pole or wall with solar panel. It communicates a real-time data to the central server and then displayed on a web or a platform. We collect data of surrounding air, which will be analyzed and visualized by AI algorithm and define actionable insight to policymaker and stakeholder. Based on that, we help them to understand our impact analysis of that action. Environmental AI platform will guide you to pollution-free route for your daily travel, better decision making for selection home or workspace or school selection for your children. 
Prakriti is being installed for a pilot run in smart city and infrastructure projects in major cities in India like Mumbai, Delhi, Vadodara, Rajkot and overseas New York, Hong Kong and few more. Let me more talk about the real case study of Silvasa where we installed 8 units for monitoring air quality for one year which result them to better policy making to our traffic industries and real estate projects NO2 and PM 2.5 level found high that has encouraged them to take a corrective action. Let's took a second important product Prakriti Light for indoor use. Prakriti Light is the world's smallest coin size personal air quality tracker which is directly connected to your mobile phone. It's a metal handcrafted passive device which get power from your mobile and it is extremely low weight of 25 grams and measuring indoor pollutant. It's a B2C product so we started selling on Amazon.in launch page platform. I'm happy to say that like we have been selected by Cell for E4 program in 2020. Now Cell is our associate partner and mentor. In last few months, we are also highlighted in India's most trusted media platform like Amazon, Blog, Your Story, INC42, Times of India, Startup India, and few more. We are working on a vision and a mission of pollution-free environment to our future generation. Thank you. Let's talk for a question and answer. The question one, the customer acquisition plan. Firstly, we are targeting the individual consultant and environmental expert who is working for environment since long time, having good exposure and deep understanding in government bodies, corporate and public entities. By providing a technical assistant with lucrative benefit to them, we aim to reach a major serviceable market across the India. Secondly, we aim to target a big corporate directly who can use a CSR fund to our solution and showcase that transparent contribution to the government and society which also help them to create their own branding and value for spending toward a good cause. We are also directly approached to the local government bodies, NGOs and environmental institute who can also use to deploy our device for environmental project. Question number two. The key competitive advantages being an early adopter into a clean tech industry, we have initially given our most of effort to R&D and trial error approach, where we have installed a various pilot with government and private entity to understand low how our device will perform in a different weather condition with respect to data accuracy. We have worked with different techies, hardware and sensor manufacturers, system integrators to understand sensor-based technology and have a clear understanding about low power scalable hardware development. This makes us a more competitive in the market. By understanding an importance of indoor air quality, we have developed a Prakriti Light, world's smallest a size plug and play device, which really considered as an innovative personal air tracker. This shows us a level of expertise we have over the competitive race. I hope by now you had a good glimpse of our digital startups. As we heard from some of the brightest minds today on how they are tackling the biggest challenges in the digitalization of the energy industry using analytics, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and computer vision. With that, we have completed the speakers and pitch sessions for day two. Be sure to attend tomorrow's event covering future of energy. Before you head off into the virtual booths to meet and hear more about the startups, remember, you can finalize your virtual investments. Please refer below the video player. Feel free to move around the virtual booths. All sessions will be recorded so you can watch them later. Thank you to our speakers partners and mentors. Thank you all for joining us today and celebrating the E4 graduation ceremony. Stay safe and stay healthy.